Oh, you shouldn't have, guys. You shouldn't have. There you go. I'm 21 again. <laughs> uh, welcome to this. We're here at uh, Love Rugby League Towers here in Warrington. This is, of course, Love Rugby League Weekly in association with our very generous sponsors, Bet Friend. My name's Dave Parkinson, or for this particular edition, hashtag birthday boy. <laughs> Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by the two Jameses, so James Gordon and James Messenger. You're, you're getting quite a following, I believe, James. Oh yeah, the crowd, the crowd love me, so I'll keep getting invited back. Uh, this is Gordon. Why, why, why have you joined us? Yeah, <laughs> you're I, never here. <laughs> you know, I thought, I thought I'd make an effort this week, what with the uh, Ottawa uh, news. It sounds like something I could talk about. If... Um, you see James going off. He does have a prior appointment, yeah, so sorry. he may be leaving. Depends how much you waffle on. It's it's about about I've got an appointment on Friday, you see, so I just wanted to <laughs> cover all bases. I think he's had enough to wait feel between you and me, to be fair. <laughs> but there we go. So what are we going to be talking about? Well, um, I want to look at what's happening on site, first of all. So it is the chance for the big oh, clubs, God. James. You, you've, you... Well, there's been some, we've got some good things on this morning, actually. Me and Drew were talking about this last night. The Barrow chairman has... has Put an ad. Is this on your agenda, Dave? This is or on my can agenda. I, can I bring you, it you up can now? Just it. Yeah, so, the, so the Barrow chairman, who caused a little bit of a stir last week with his column in the Northwest Evening Mail, where he was saying um, about the RFL's incompetence, basically. Well, his column this week has a few interesting points about dual registration. Apparently, the clubs are all against it, which we sort of know, but he, he hinted that even the teams that use it are against it. But his big suggestion, and it's one we've mentioned on this show before, was to have reserve teams play in League One. Okay, so we're going to be discussing that, so hold that point. And we've got, I mean, apart from that, we've got the usual stuff. We've got Off The Record, Gossip Column. Drew did an expansionist blog with Fiji on Fiji yesterday. Um, all the normal six tackles. We've got match previews for the weekend. Loads of stuff on the site. In fact, and Drew will kill me if I don't mention this, so I've got to. Drew's done a brilliant feature on Sean Wayne's best 13 players that we he's can brought relate through. We can again. <laughs> he brought through 41 academy products during his tenure at Wigan um, and that's a, a theme that we're going to look at maybe once a month where we're going to pick a coach and see what players he's brought through obviously Sean Wayne's role at Wigan but we've already had a look at a few other coaches who've maybe brought players through at different clubs and, and handed them their first team debut so um, keep an eye out for that but I know Drew spent a lot of time on that piece so uh, give him a shout out. There is chance as well for you to win Castleford and Wakefield tickets for the 18th of April, Monday, Thursday, and a bachelor's mushy peas ball as well, which for me is the ultimate. Is that so a ball we... made of mushy peas? <laughs> well, I hope not, otherwise it'd be a bit <laughs> knock-ons, wouldn't it? It'd get a bit messy as well, wouldn't it? Um, so I thought, things that we could talk about today, and this is for you guys as well. So what I want from your point of view out there, and uh, tweet us, message us, do whatever you do to, to contribute like you normally do, which is fantastic. But, um, you know, I want your thoughts on something that James was mentioning there regarding what do you reckon about academy teams or second teams playing in the professional structure? Should they be included or are you a dinosaur like me and not wanting this to take place at all? Um, good week and bad week. Who's had a good week? Who's been terrible? So, you know, for me, the bad weeks continue to stack up for Wigan, don't they, with regards to... Uh, usually you get at least one transfer a year that doesn't go through because somebody's blabbed saying somebody signed the contract. It's very rare it happens regarding a coach, and it's never happened before at Wigan. So it just shows everyone's susceptible, doesn't it? So do remember you can get in touch with us, share this as much as you like as well. Let's start, first of all, then. Big thing, Ottawa. What a load of garbage. How has this been allowed to happen? Hebel Stags have well, been we, taken over. Well, we were just saying weren't we, before we came on air that you know, regardless of what you think of, of the whole North American project or whatever, how ridiculous is it that to get a Canadian club playing at a 24,000 st stadium with a, a big consortium of money men, to get them into the league, they have to buy an amateur club's licence, because that's what Hebel are, isn't it? An amateur club pl who play in front of 100 people to get in the third division of the English, you know, of the British, whatever you want to call it, league. I mean, it's. I think someone's got someone's got to look at this in logical terms. You know, I'm a you know fair play to Toronto for what they've done and they've gone in the bottom way the way up. But I think now if they're gonna go ahead with this North American thing, they've just got to go straight to Super League because I just don't I just don't see how 
it, it fit, you know, like next year, could you imagine Oldham versus New York at the Vesta Care Stadium? Who makes way though? Does anybody make way of? No, I, I, think I expand, because it's expansion, isn't it, Dave? I mean, it start, Super League oh, started... Oh, right, I'll tell you what they could do. They could sign up all these uh, 18 players that aren't getting a game. And, well, there so, you go. Mm. Well, I said that the other day, actually, on Twitter. But if you think Super League started in 1996, it had 12 teams. What are we now? 2019. Super League still got 12 teams. It works still like that top <laughs> number, doesn't it? But, yeah, but you say that, but obviously, to expand the game, surely the nature of expansion means you've got to add more teams. But and why are we talking about Ottawa? We can't even go to Preston and well, do it, can well, we? Yeah, I mean, you yeah. I, mean I, I mean, I think the whole transatlantic thing is bomb, because, I mean, I think if, if it was a realistic sort of, you know, if it was a realistic long-term, you know, path to follow, why haven't football done it? Why haven't rugby done it? We, we talk about NFL. The NFL sell out Wembley three times a year or whatever, and yet still they don't have a London team in the NFL, and they've got a proven track record. You know, everyone's getting giddy. Oh, yeah, there's men in America with money, and, you know, it's a massive market, but are any... it's a massive market. You've still got to get into it just because there's a massive market. And, you know, okay, it's good that Toronto gets 7,000 every week. You know, it's a good, you know, it's a fair platform, but... It doesn't stack up with the, the rest of the game, I don't think, at the moment. Well, what sorry, do you reckon? Sorry, the, the, the idea of putting them straight in, into Super League, do you, do you think that's maybe a bit detrimental to the idea of promotion and relegation? Because if, if you're a team in the Championship and you see this new team with lots of money who are getting told that they can go straight into the top flight, whereas they've been working for five, ten years, they'll be thinking, hold on, why is this happening? Just because they're a team abroad? But I think this is part of the issue you've got, is we're trying to shoehorn franchises, because that's what... Catalan are and what can I, we're trying to shoehorn franchises into a traditional league system and it's like you're right I mean I'm a massive advocate of promotional relegation I think you'd always have it but imagine at the end of this season if London get relegated and Toronto get promoted is that beneficial to Super mm. League realistically you know I don't I don't think it is my, my opinion is maybe you look at can you retain an element of promotion relegation but then when you've got these expansion sides that they can go straight in but not at the expense of anyone else because I think that's the problem is if you look at what generally happens is when a new when a team like Catalan come in or, or whoever you know look at Bradford I mean obviously the Bradford situation was a little peculiar because of everything that went on but ultimately they got relegated when the, the league chopped to 12 and, and they are now much weaker than they were when they were in Super League now imagine if they were able to have stayed in Super League, but you still were able to add the extra teams in and, and whatever and that's the way I look at it I'm thinking that's 12 now if New York and Ottawa want to come in, let's make it 14, but still retain that one up, one down. But then you also have the issue, well, what happens if Toronto finish bottom? What happens if Ottawa finish bottom? What What are these clubs actually going to do to develop the game, though? Well, it's all right, you're parachuting teams in there and creating them, but they're a falsehood, aren't they? There's nothing there. There's nothing to underpin it. Yeah, okay, I you've mean, got a few rich people that want yeah, to I mean, money obviously the play, burn it. Well, if you look now, too good, I mean, we'll talk about, like, look, look at London Broncos, right? London Broncos have been around for 30 years, whatever, and there's, 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 you know, there's more and more players from that sort of region playing in Super League. But most impressively, perhaps this season, is London have kept faith in a, a very young, homegrown team, and they're doing, you know, they're competing. Now, it's taken them 20 years, 30 years to get to that point. Is there enough time for that to happen in Toronto and, you know, and any, anywhere else? You know, look at surely, look at Widnes. Like, look at surely, Widnes is a good example of another club who Widnes are now yeah. building their whole team around players that they've produced. So, player production is a massive thing. Surely, you've got to actually have people playing the sport before you can transport a team into an area. This is where I think rugby league development has always, always gone wrong. It's always like they've gone, where can we have it? And then they've chucked a dart at a map somewhere. Well, I always find it. Team. I always find the whole international game a little bit like that. It's like as soon as there's twenty players playing rugby league in Serbia. It's like, oh, we've got a national team. And it's like, well, have you? Do you know what I mean? It's like they're almost playing by default because they're the only 20 Serbian rugby league players in the world. Mm. It's, like, it's like with some of these teams that are coming in, say the likes of Ottawa, New York, things like that, I think, I think they may be doing it the wrong way around because what, what would be the most sustainable model is growing the sport first, getting a pool of players who want to get involved, and then after that, build on that success and then introduce a team. I think they're, some of these franchises are kind of hedging the bets on the fact that if they pump a lot of money in and they create a team, then that's all of a sudden going to create an influx of <laughs> influx of people coming in. And that, that, I don't know, I just don't think that, that's the case, really. It's like building today, we're coming yeah, to I mean, feel the dreams. Yeah. Stuff, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I mean, I think I, just having a, I was just having a thing on Twitter with someone about this, that I think 10 years ago, they talked about creating a full-time league in America 
mm-hmm. NRL US. Now, you know, America's been a bit fractured over the last decade where there's been two rival governing bodies and one's ended up it's being It's a rugby league story, isn't yeah. it, really, that? And, it's like, and I think that's the thing, is it's like, what is the end game with it all? Because surely the end game is, yeah, you'd want a North American league. But as we've seen with Catalan, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You, you know, if Toronto and Ottawa and whoever else establish themselves in Super League, at what point are they going to turn around and say, actually, we don't want to be part of this thing that we've helped build. We want to go and be part of something like that. And that's... We've seen that with Catalan. There's no way Catalan would go back and play in the French League. But the French League isn't getting any better. We're not adding any more French teams in. So it's like, well, well where are we going? What's the, what's the purpose of it all? So, you know, I think, you know, for me, it's like, you've got to be... We are in this chat about, about fran- if, if you make it franchise, make it a bit more franchise. I mean, we've talked about the World League idea before, but... Could you, uh, could you say, right, well, we'll, add, we'll ask the three North American teams, we'll ask the two French teams, and then say the best five English teams, put them in a you know, a 10-team league, play each other twice, that's it. Because obviously Toronto have got the issue where they can't play at home until May or whatever it is. So if you make the season shorter, it suits them. If you look at the NFL model, they play a lot less games and you know they still generate the money. And then for the English clubs, and this is where your B-team idea comes in, Dave, so you like your Wiggins and your Saints who are only playing... They're playing less games because they're in the World League thing. Their second team, effectively, could still play in the English system. So, do you see what I mean? So, it's like the Wigan's, you know, Wigan's premier players can play in the World League and then the rest of the Wigan players can play in the English League. But then, because the season's quite short, you might find some of them premier players can still play for Wigan in the Championship or whatever you're going to call it. You've given a bit of thought to this, aren't you? It's it's doing his research. But that's what, but the thing is, is someone's got to do that, Dave, and that's the problem. I think the problem is, is that, you know, you've got Nigel Wood basically just going wherever there's money. And it's like, someone's got to sit down and think, where do we want to get to? And actually say, this is what we're aiming at. Because at the moment, you've got all the clubs are sort of, everyone's got their own agenda, haven't they? All the clubs are looking at it like, well, we want this, we want this, we want this. Someone at the RFL's got to say, right, this is the plan. We want... And, and they've got this loose plan of we want more, we want we only want teams that are going to bring more commercial revenue, more spectators, and develop a new player pool. I, you know, I've seen a few emails as to what they're looking for in these franchises. But someone's got to look at well, what are we working towards? Because ultimately, if you, where have we got the last fifteen years, and I always mention this article I wrote about two thousand and four. You're stuck the last two thousand and four. No, no, no. <laughs> but the, you, no, but the reason, no, but the reason, no, but the reason, skills played in the background. No, but the reason, was number one, the man. reason why I say that is because all this mucking around that's been done over fifteen years, and the games not actually got anywhere. And now we're two years away from it basically all falling apart if Sky don't. Don't pay the money. Yeah, and it, it, it's quite interesting on the subject of going back to Ottawa and New York, those kinds of things. We've had, actually had quite a few comments coming in about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so do, you want, a, do you want to go through them? Yeah, I'll go through them. So we've got um, Louis Banks says that these expansionist teams should be given a chance, but they need to start outside of Super League. Like, so kind of going to achieve, but they need to build a fan base, working skills, and get a pathway system for players. Okay. And that, that kind of links into what I was saying. They need to get the infrastructure first before. Yeah. There's even hopes of them getting higher up. I think that I think that I think my problem with them going in the lower leagues is that it, it effectively mean it effectively makes the league less competitive because basically you've got this behemoth in like Toronto will walk the league because they've got the most money. And then the also thing is like surely the point of having New York and Ottawa in is to get more sponsors or whatever it is or to get the is it a good look for rugby league that New York are trying to spread the game? And with all due respect to Oldham or Dewsbury or whatever, that the games are at those sorts of grounds. Surely that goes against the theory behind having them in. And, and what, what are other people saying? Uh, we've had um, Michael Wilde has put ludicrous to have transatlantic teams when most clubs aren't even running a second team. I've actually had uh, an interesting point from one of our own. Drew, he's got in touch and he's put, it took Melbourne more than 20 years to get a Victorian player coming through and look at where they are now. Australia's a completely different market, though. I mean, it's like the number one sport for half of it. Yeah, it's different talking about maybe bringing players through in a country where rugby league's already prominent yeah, yeah, compared yeah. to a country where it's just trying to grow. You've, you've got to introduce it. I mean, we, uh, I can I can say with a little bit of experience having worked in Manchester, Manchester is a long way to go, and yet mm. the rugby league are on about taking the... the I mean, the other, the other th- problem you've got with Toronto is because, as an example, is because they've got to be based over here for long parts of the year does that does that help them develop players i'm you know i'm not sure it's a great it's not a great sort of foundation to develop players when ultimately their operation is probably over here for what eight months of the year i suppose a plus point to ottawa though is that is that not in french speaking Canada? 
No. Is it not dual soap? Maybe they could know, get yeah. more French. Maybe more French. Maybe more French but players then, could get But then if you think about if, if the teams actually in France aren't producing that many players, then how's, how's it going to work with the team in Canada? Even though it's French speaking, it's just going to have the same issue of, in, of introducing more players into a system. What I'd be really interested to see whether this happened, and I don't know when it would happen, but you know like you get players in scholarships. <laughs> Do you get to the point where Toronto are, are saying to English kids at 14, come and move to Toronto? And come in our academy. Well, it's happening in Australia, that. Well, and that's what honest, I mean. You know, but I think the, you look the, at the, the Polynesian. You know, and obviously, but obviously, the question marks over that is: Can that happen if Toronto are based over here for the majority of the year? They've already said that they want to make strategic partners, don't they, of the existing Hemel structures? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting as well when you look at a team like a team in North America, for example, and you've got a young kid over there who wants to get involved with rugby and he sees this team and he's he wants to aspire to be one of them. And if he asks his parents, oh, where, where are all these players playing? And they say, oh, well, they spent two thirds of the year in a completely different country over in England. It, it's kind of hard for them to aspire and want to do that when they know that the majority of the operations for the likes of Ottawa, the likes of a Toronto Wolfpack and arguably what could be New York side, it's going to be the same sort of problem. You, you're not going to get that many young Canadians getting into the game if a lot of the players that they aspire to be are on the other side of the world most of the time. Before we move on from this topic, have we got any more comments, James, yeah, about we've had, it? We've had, we've had quite a few interesting comments looking at the idea of the RFL need to focus on a reserve grade before we look at the transatlantic Atlantic idea. So Michelle Bell put, I think they need to build their own teams in their own country, start from the roots and build from there. So again, yeah. that links into, I the, agree with you, Michelle. links into the infrastructure. I've also had a couple of birthday wishes for you, Dave. Oh. Had a birthday wish of Jonathan, Sherrod and Fred. <laughs> happy birthday, son. <laughs> there you go. Right, right, there we go. So, yes, so th- I'll, I'll be going a similar sort of shade to the, t- to the shirt <laughs> right now. Um, right, moving on. Right, let's get this second elephant out of the room. So, this comment from Steve Neal. Uh, I know it's, you, you're a big advocate of it. Uh, yeah, I think it's a decent idea because I just think there's obviously, this, there's obviously an issue with... But for whatever reason, that the reserve league ain't happening. You've got a third division that's a bit short on teams. You know, they're not playing. You know, they're playing what twenty games. Mm-hmm. So if you added another four or five teams, all of a sudden they're playing thirty games. But my example was when Coventry play Leeds in the preseason, they get like twelve hundred or whatever the crowd was, and um, and that's Leeds's academy team or whatever it is. So I just sort of think because the majority of the teams now in that division are development teams, is you could have Wigan Warriors rocking up on a Sunday with their reserve team, and it just adds a little bit more credence to the league. And I, I think that teams like Wigan, people would go and watch Wigan Reserves. You know, if Wigan Reserves were playing at Sunday at 3 o'clock, I think people would go and watch. You know, because there's obviously this discussion about Friday night games and stuff like that. And I'm not saying... But what, you do, you, th- what do you base that on? You know, because surely, surely once... They've been a couple of times. They soon realise it's not the Wigan first team. Won't they? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not saying you pretend that it's not the Wigan first team, but I still think there's, I still think there's enough. There'll be enough of Wigan's fan base that would watch their reserves week in week out against Coventry or North Wales or whatever. And then likewise from them other teams, it's surely better for Coventry to be playing even Wigan Warriors reserves than it is to be. You know, it, it, it adds a bit more glamour to it surely, and the fact that you might on the off chance see. Uh, George Williams coming through, or you might even see a Thomas Lulai coming back from injury. Do you know what I mean? So, you, 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 sorry, you get you get a lot of uh, yeah. you get a lot of fans, as you said, like a, a loyal supporter base who, who would go and watch that just because a lot of fans are interested in younger players. They have got that that knowledge and they want to find out more about who's coming through the system. Expand a little bit more, James, because I think that you're sort of aligning yourself a little bit with James's idea here. Do, are you sort of more, yeah. more in favour of it? Than yeah, against it? I kind of agree with James. I think I think it would be a good idea. I think that that competition, the third division, maybe maybe does need a bit not spruce up, but something something different about it. And bringing in reserve teams and whatnot, bringing them in there, I think it, I think that could work. I th- I think we want main... your comments as well, so I'd love for you to join in on this this discussion as well. Like you were saying before, Dave, it's like League One's a bit. It's almost in a bit of a quandary, isn't it? It's like it's sort of a bit more than amateur, but not quite good enough for Championship. And it's like, but you're always going to get that. Well, no, I know you're always going to get you? that, Dave. But what I mean is, is you're looking at it and you're a bit like, well, could we? You could you could effectively expand the semi pro leagues and because obviously at the moment you, you're sort of stuck between you've got too many for one league but you've not really got enough for two leagues can i chuck something else here 
maybe the Super League clubs didn't go and hoover up all the available talent from okay. 15 plus, we wouldn't have this issue anyway because they'd be able to go to other clubs. Well, I mean, I mean, potentially, I mean, but then at the same time, these are the clubs that have got the full time environment for these players, and that is the best. That is, well, arguably the best way of of developing better quality players. Um, now, you know, the other theory is, do you do it where? I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with this theory, but you could you could base Wigan reserves team in Chorley or even in Preston, like you were saying, to try and grow the game a little bit there. See, even even that has more merits than somebody going chucking the millions in a country which has no interest in rugby. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I mean, the thing is, is everyone's all a bit. Everyone gets a bit gooey eyed, don't they? They see, you know, fair play. They're, they're, they're chucking a load of money in. But just because someone's putting in a, a shed load of money over there doesn't mean it's going to work. No. Doesn't mean that all the sponsors are going to come knocking on the door. Doesn't mean that, you know, broadcast deals are going to come. And yeah, obviously, I'm not saying don't do it, but I think people are a little bit, get a little bit too caught up in the whole fantasy land of it and without being realistic. I have to admit, I'm, I'm against this idea. And I'm against it because I think it cheapens it all. I think it, you're then moving everybody a step even closer to amateur and oblivion because well, ultimately no one will care. Yeah, but as 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 clubs, if if say for example, if the RFL aren't willing to make reserve grade mandatory, then surely this is the next best alternative. They get into play rugby in a relatively same professional environment. Get but they could still set their own leagues up. Yeah. They, why, why do they need that RFL jurisdiction? We've got Super League going off on but, its own. So but is the, they is the problem? Well, I mean, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, I, I, but then at the same time, I sort of think even with us, even if you did that, I still think. If you get to the point where only five or six super league teams want to run reserves, why can't you just bang them in League One and have, you know, hmm. because yeah. because if you think right, if and, and I know what you're saying, but, but I know what you're saying they about can't get promoted, can they? No, well, they the can't. They can't get promoted into the same league as their parent club base. Oh, so we so could end up with Wigan playing Championship against yeah. Witness. So yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah, would yeah, you feel yeah, though? Yeah. As no, a, I, I, what, well, that's fine. What would you feel as a Witness fan turning up to a game thinking, right, I'm going to pay? 22 quid or however much it is to get in a witness and all you're seeing is a is a, a let's put a league reserve, reserve team or a Wigan reserve yeah, well, team. that's effectively what you're getting now anyway when you play like Featherstone or, yeah. or whatever isn't it in some ways or Swinton or whatever but what and you know that's fine if that's what we decide that's what's happening because what what I'm saying is you, obviously your <laughs> argument is that the play the, the hoovering up if you said to all 12 Super League clubs you've got to have reserves what's going to happen Casford and Wakefield well I mean all Wakefield got reserves they're going to end up signing players that may have ended up playing for Batley or Dewsbury or whatever so by forcing it onto them 12 you're then taking players away whereas if you just let the clubs who've got you're not necessarily taking it away because you'll always find play. in fact teams will down the rugby league chain, will probably be more likely to look at the amateur scene again. The local amateur. Club. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just playing devil's advocate to your point about them hooving up the players. At the moment, it would appear that maybe only six Super League teams want to run a reserve team. Obviously, Catalan, you probably wouldn't have them in because they're in the French league anyway. Yeah. See so that oh, immediately down to eleven. Um, I know Salford were trying to get. So, has the president been set there? The fact that Catalans are operating reserve set up. In well, the I think I think that's tradition. a good example of because Catalan effectively is a franchise, isn't it? In Super League, mm. that's a good example of well, okay, the franchise team is in that league, and then we have a second team that plays in the domestic comp, and that's what happens in in, in you know we were talking about about rugby union before. And so, as well, say for example, if you got a, a Wigan Wigan reserves, a Saints reserves, a Warrington reserves, eventually working their way up to the championship. I think as fans of the championship, that that would raise the standards because if, for example, you had, with no disrespect, a Rochdale or a Swinton going up against a Wigan Reserves, a Leeds Reserves, I think it'd be a close game. And I think I think not only would it be beneficial for players, it'd raise the, raise the profile of the competition even more and drive the standards. And another thing linking to that, which um, we've got a comment in by Johnny Wright, it talks about the benefits for players. So players going on dual red compared to being in a reserve team. And he says... It'd be easy for a player who plays reserve grade to make the first two because they'll clearly play some structure and plays, so they'll get they'll get used to that compared to if they're on dual reg. And I think you the, could argue the other way, though. I mean, I, I know I saw something that I think it was Drew put a post on about Ollie Russell because he's he's been on he started the season on loan at Lee. He's obviously a Huddersfield player and he played for Batley at the weekend. In some ways, and I'm putting the boot on the other foot with the, the dual reg here for a second. So forgive me for being completely hypocritical to everything <laughs> that I've said. Is that not developing a player in Ollie Russell better because he's already sampled 
three different clubs cultures well yeah but does it but does that make it is that the sign of a better player the fact that he's been at three different clubs I don't think it is, is it, it not could be- make him a better player is it not because be- he's then getting all the different calls and yeah but players. is it not better for him to be playing week in week out in, a, in, in the same culture in the same environment building relationships with players you know isn't that better that you know rather than oh this week he might be playing for Batley or he might not depends if Wigan won him or not and you know even even for the players around and I don't think I don't think teams maybe I mean look at Swinton last season with Josh Woods when Woods was there they were much better when he wasn't there they were how much of an impact does that have on the players around him the other players at Swinton well to be honest any different. Super League player anybody in a Super League structure if you drop them into another team they should improve that team shouldn't they yeah, but, but what I'm saying is I don't think you could say that it's better for Oliver Russell to be going, not knowing where he's going to be each week, some weeks not playing at all, when he could quite feasibly be playing in the same reserve team week in, week out. Because you'd imagine that if he played, say if he played for Huddersfield Reserves 10 weeks running and was impressive, the coach might look at it and think, well, actually, we'll give him a run because he's played with a few of the other players that we're bringing in. You know, and that's another thing that, you know, maybe... We don't we don't look at is developing relationships in the reserve team. So if you've yeah. got if Huddersfield have got a few young lads who are playing together in the reserves, and all of a sudden you know obviously Huddersfield struggling a little bit at the moment, they might look well. Actually, them three or four players look like they link up pretty well in that Huddersfield reserve team. So let's get them in the first team, and then they all know each other and they play off each other. And as as a player as well, you you'll develop more as you said. You'll develop more playing in that same team, that same environment, making links compared to if you had two games at one club, three games at another, and. If you think about the idea of these reserve clubs going into League One or maybe even cr- progressing to the Championship, it's still be the same standard. Okay. Have we had any other comments? I'd love to. I'd love for any Championship and League One fans to sort of join this debate as well. So even if you're watching this afterwards, after we've sort of gone and we're all at home having our tea, you're looking forward to on the demand. Game tonight, the the on is, is, it, is that where it I is? I don't know. <laughs> That's what we're if you're watching it later and you're not watching it live, then still stick your comments down because I'd be interested to read. I'll say we've got, we've got an interesting comment again off Louis and he says Warrington currently coach local amateur coaches showing them the structures of the club etc yeah that's a fine idea so the coach if, coaches to make coaches better and that, that's the thing so it says so that if, if these kids are picked up by Warrington for their academy they're already used to the way of coaching the systems the plays that... Warrington do a couple of smart things actually yeah. sort of locally don't they Where they're in touch with every local amateur club that, anyway. that's, what, that's what you need clubs, clubs should be doing that anyway because that, that's how clubs grow how they're using their expertise to help others and if Warrington Wolves are working with clubs in the community then that's not only going to help the clubs in the community but it means they're going to forge those links and they'll in turn have access to the better players and that's that's what makes the club's reserve grades grow. I'm always of the opinion that a professional clubs should sit at the top of a pyramid in its area with everything feeding to it. Now, it doesn't happen in every team in every, team in every town yeah. uh, but that should be what, something that we're aiming at rather than sticking... Now, reserves in competitions. I mean, obviously, I don't want to. You don't want to necessarily drag the amateur thing into this, but you know, potentially, if you had Warrington reserves, say in League One, they could dual reg with amateur teams potentially to give those amateur players a bit of a chance to be yeah. in a professional structure. As long as you're going back to the original amateur club that you signed for. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, be, yeah, yeah, That's what you'd yeah, want, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, because yeah, there are there are lads that could probably be playing for the likes of Lee Miners and Lee East who are on yeah. Wigan's books on centre. I mean, I don't want to open another can of worms to this day, but then that could be something that if you switched amateur back to winter, that fit in nicely. You know, like players who want to play recreationally can just play throughout the winter. But players who've maybe got aspirations of playing centre <coughs> could, in theory, play for Warrington Reserves through the summer and then be dual reg back to their amateur club in the winter. You know, uh, I mean, it was happening to a certain extent. I think he was in the North West Men's League last season, but you had to go back to the club that he was, you signed from. Because mm. uh, there was a couple of lads that ended up playing back at Wigan St. Pat's, I think, who were on like Coventry's books or on other teams. I could be a bit wrong there, but that's the general, the general idea. Um, so maybe that's something that I would sooner that happen than set teams up in uh, divisions in furnace, you know. But that, that's that's my um, sticking with League One. 
Uh, what do we make of Richard Moore's retirement? Best of luck in your recovery, Richard. It's been a good seeing you play over the last 18 years for a variety. I think he's had 10 different clubs. <laughs> yeah, 10 clubs, it was saying, 350 plus appearances. Yeah, tremendous, tremendous career. We were, rec we were recollecting his, uh, his Lee days before, weren't we? Yeah, I think he played about 18 games for Lee and got sent off two or three times from memory. <laughs> there was one particular pre season friendly, it was against Widney. Was that when, by when they had Bybee as well? So uh, Bybee and Moore were the front row. Uh, yeah, the other yeah. side of Paul Rowland. Uh, and we had and we had the other Bybee yeah, as well. So there's Bybee, two yeah, Bybees, and... back, you know, because Adam had just come back from Whitney, etc. Yeah, Ricky Bybee and Richard uh, Moore. Uh, either uh, side of Paul Rowland, yeah, it was a bit of a... Yeah, yeah, it was good, but uh, I, I believe that... Um, I believe Smith's still trying to get out of Paul Rowland's pocket all these years oh, later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I remember this pre-season friendly. Um, Whitney said little Gary Hulse playing for him and he signed from Warrington, a, a scrum half. And <laughs> Richard Moore picked him up tucked him, put him back down again and walked off. He didn't even wait to get shown the red card because he knew he was on his way. I, one memory I've got of Richard Moore is I remember, um, I think I, 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 I'd been away for like four weeks and my first game back was, wait, it was at Wakefield and Wakefield playing witness and I think it was a Sky game. And Wakefield scored a try early doors where witness were like running the ball out the back and Richard Moore come out the line, he must have been a good five yards offside because there's no way he was this quick. Oh, he's quick, he'd shut he's out, quick he'd, shut out the, well, he'd shut out the line, tackled someone, they'd knocked on, wait for the pit the ball up and scored, and it was like, uh, that's one, of, one lasting memory I've got of Richard. Moore. I mean, he's been a tremendous servant to rugby league, let's put it that way, because if, you if you're going around 10 different clubs, then you're, you're putting the hard yards in, aren't you? You're putting that's, the mileage up. As exactly, well. it shows how much you love the game, the fact that he's gone to all these different clubs and his, his standards never let up, he's always been high quality consummate professional it's a shame that it's, it's ended in this way but obviously wish him all the best and he's had a good run at 37 anyway he has as well yeah to see where the where the future takes him now uh, but best of luck from us um also as well in in league one for the pick of the action for me came at white even last week there were four points to nil down at half time against doncaster <laughs> i thought this would be really really close and so it was turning out after 40 minutes second 40 it's all white even my mate jason mossett goes over for a try Jake Moore, Jesse Joe Parker, and DNI all score with Moore kicking three goals, Connor Holiday kicking two. Doncaster only managed the extra try. Um, well, Doncaster, of course, had that game, their first game was the reversal, wasn't it? Where uh, Doncaster were down to Newcastle in the first game and turned it around in the second mm. half and won, so. Uh, must be a one-half team, Doncaster. So. <laughs> it depends which half. Hopefully things improve for them. But that's that's my pick of pick of the action there. Have we had any more thoughts? Any anybody else sending us messages? Uh, there's there's a few people having a discussion amongst themselves still about the Ottawa, about the franchises. See, that's going to run and run, isn't it? Any, anything interesting that you think you can chuck into the mix? Uh, yeah, there's been there's been a few a few good comments. Um, Someone said, Michelle said, how about doing more college courses to build the game up for kids and get them interested before they try doing franchises? College courses? College courses, yes. And maybe getting kids, of, it's worth it getting kids of that age. So, so maybe, so, so what we're talking about is proper scholarships. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And if, that, oh, yeah, if that's the way that they want to grow. And also, I believe yeah, they yeah. something like that in France. Yeah. For, for yeah, time. well, they do. I mean, I mean obviously, talk about, talk about football college. But With rugby in, union, I mean. In, in, in football, they have sort of, in non-league football, they've got this 16, they've got, a football academy which is for 16 to 18 year olds and they can basically go in they have two years and um, they get a b-tech qualification or whatever it is but at that time they're effectively playing for that club's academy oh, for okay. the two years um, and obviously the idea you know obviously non-league they're semi-pro anyway so the idea is is that potentially those players could graduate from playing for the academy to playing for for the first team, so I so think that's an idea. Is there ideas like that? that maybe I think, I think is that not similar to what Halifax do? I think Halifax is that not what a, a, a Cat Three Academy is? You know, like what Swinton is some Lee, respects, but they, similar to what Lee and Swinton are doing. They 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 might be linked, but they're not linked as in having to go into the professional club. Right. So I, I guess that's probably the where they're wanting to get to. Yeah. You know, yeah it does yeah, sound right. like that maybe. That may be the way forward. Mm. That I like that as an idea. Yeah, and it is is another good idea for you talking about how how we make these franchises grow in the mm -hmm. likes of Ottawa, New York. But coming off Louis, you says, why don't the RFL make these clubs put a bond in place that is non withdrawable? But that can only be used to employ development officers based in these cities. They're employed right. on a ten year contract to work in schools and college and try and get more kids in the game and make the game take off. And I think that's that that's a good way of doing it. If if mm -hmm. if we're wanting to see how we can develop these kids in rugby league at 
at this kind of school level, I think doing something like that's a great idea. Now, allegedly... You look like you're going to chuck a bombshell in here, James. Hang on, let me get comfortable. Allegedly, these teams are being asked for bonds of half a million pounds. Well, I shouldn't say bonds. More like a consultancy fee. And there's a little bit of controversy and, you know, some shady sort of dealings going on somewhere, I, I believe, or that, that has been alleged to me. I'm trying to do some digging on it, but um, you can imagine what it's like. But there's certainly something a little bit untoward, maybe, about some of the... Uh, some of the procedures maybe so we'll see how that goes but i think if go back to that idea you know if you if you could if you could do it that way but then surely in theory they, they should be doing that anyway that should be the purpose yeah. I, I, I do like that point though there's, there's a couple of really good ones there so thank you very it's much on the ball today I, this is what i'm liking right championship <coughs> oh no just what i've got one other thing from league one sorry i wanted to call in my good week column corey aston are you not going to mention Dennis Betts? Well, I suppose you could do that. Well, well I suppose you mention him now. Leave to you, really. You, you, like you, true witness you, you mentioned that. But uh, Corey Aston, he hasn't been playing much, but he makes his debut for Newcastle. Two tries, four goals. On the flip side, though, he did have 11 attempts to get those four goals. So maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, goal kicking wasn't his best on that day or conditions. Maybe they were forward, just all out wide. They could have been, they could have been, but uh, well done Corey Aston, nice to see you back on the field, decent player, I like him. Yeah. Uh, right, Championship, um, I've got three points here really, Witness Revival well underway, James? Yeah, no I thought they, they weren't great on Sunday but obviously they, Rubbish game. they, got, away with, they got away with a win in the end, I thought, I think Craven, uh, I think Danny Craven's playing well, I think he's playing well, yeah. I think I said if he, play, if he carries on playing like his, he'll be a contender for Championship player of the year. Jordan Johnston as well had a really really good well, game. Well, so Johnston's had to play the eighty minutes because obviously the the, the RFL aren't letting witness register Speedman, um, which is what's a, the re what's the reason behind why they're not? So they, things not in place with, at the moment. Yeah, so it's to do with the budget and the business plan hasn't been signed off. So they've got Speedman and Lewis Johnson from Warrington who they've signed and can't register. Um, so witness are a bit thin on the ground because of that. Um, Are witness still going to be able to afford to run full time till the end of the season? I think that's obviously one of the. Uh, that's obviously what they're trying to do. I think my understanding is is if they can get through to the end of the season, right. and obviously you can review it, and it's just trying to make the numbers stack up for the rest of the season. So, um, you know, John Johnston's. I mean, if something happened to Johnston, witness would be in a real, a real pickle. I think. Hmm, okay, uh, but yeah, I, mean, I thought it was a real scrappy game that one. I thought that. I, so I thought I thought, I thought I was, Gillen was lucky to stop on. I was a bit disappointed with Bradford, to be honest. Um, they in are, terms of they are down both halfbacks. Yeah, they miss each other. I think I? they just. I don't know. I was. I mean, obviously it was twelve nil, and you were sat there thinking, despite with Brown, not got much quality, but they really dug in and put a shift in, yeah, yeah. and made it. You know, made obviously a good game of it. I thought Witness dominated large parts of the game, but they just couldn't finish Bradford off. Um, you know, I think second half. Witness was starting most of their sets near enough halfway, weren't they? It was only Bradford, the last fifteen minutes yeah, where Bradford, Bradford just, got a bit of field position. Yeah, yeah Bradford just it? couldn't get out of their own half, and um, but not a good win for Witness. I, you know, I still think, and I've said, I think Witness has still got a shot at getting top five. Uh, Toulouse, they're still playing. Oh, they uh, they are now coming really to the good. People sort of question when they have that wobble at the start of the season, mm -hmm. but I think it's it's either four or five games that they've gone unbeaten. Then they beat Barrow fifty 0 at the weekend. And did you see some of them tries? Yeah, they were very good tries, weren't they? Beautiful. Good, really good team performance, some flowing rugby, which can, I think I spoke last week about watching Toronto in some of their games and some of their rugby was a bit disjointed and then you look at what Toulouse are producing and it's completely the they opposite. They back you up. They this, do. this is nice. You know, usually I say something, <laughs> the exact opposite happens. Is so it, it's really in your favour. The rugby you know? got to run nice is it, is it a culture thing with Toulouse? Because Catalan are the same out where they start really slow and it's like, is it... You know, is it because it takes them a few games to get... Where You know, obviously, whereas in England, with yeah, yeah. the traditional is, you know, get ready in the pre-season games, it's almost as if the first two or three rounds are treated as pre-season for the French team. Do we ever see Catalan and Toulouse really play in pre-season games, or do you reckon it's I there? Think they play the odd one, don't they? But mm. I, don't, I think they, they always seem to, both of them, they always seem to start fairly slowly. So, obviously, if you look at some of the, the Super League teams over here, especially the ones that are coached by an Australian side, I know Warrington is a major example, they get them back into pre-season training very early because they want them to be firing on all cylinders for the first pre-season game, let alone the first game of the season. Mm. I think that, that's where... That's where they differ. Maybe the French clubs it might be something to do with the culture. I'm not entirely sure, but 
Yeah, you, they, they always seem to be slightly less prepared, I think, mm-hmm. than the Super League teams. But they make it up for it now, though, aren't they? They are, yeah. But as as I say, it's depending what happens towards the end of the season, you don't you don't want to let a slow start cost you. Obviously, now they're coming they're coming good. They're playing well. I think something in recent seasons that we've seen with Toulouse is maybe they've got that flowing attack, but can they do it in defence? And they've, they've shown it again. What was it to to nil against Barrow? Yeah. So they they really that really come on for them, and that that's gonna. Hold, hold them in good stead when they push to try and get promoted this year. The next point that I wanted to mention, I think you've mentioned it as well in one of your articles, James, was about this whole log jam that we've got for fifth place at the moment. It's, it's really stacking up well, isn't it? So yeah. there's there's basically there's three portions to the championship, isn't there? It looks like you've got your top four who are going to stay there. There's a real battle emerging for fifth. Then you've got everybody else. Who are you top four, Dave? Well, at the moment, it's the top four. Oh, you're talking about the top four now, right? Uh, that's so. in the top four there at the moment because they're winning. <coughs> so you're looking at Toronto, <coughs> Toulouse, York, Sheffield, Sheffield and York. Mm-hmm. And then there's this real logjam beneath them between Lee, Featherstone, Halifax and Bradford. You could probably jump win this in there in the next three or four weeks mm. where, as the wins start to stack up with them retaining this full-time uh, line. So, like to top. me, I look at it like Toronto will finish first. So I just think they're... You know, you, you, you count them as top. And then I honestly think now that that next chunk, uh, come the end of the season, is going to be between seven or eight. And I think, you know, like you say, you've got the six. If you look at last season where there was the top six, you've mm-hmm. got them same six apart from obviously witness of Swap with London. Yeah. But then you've got your Bradford and Sheffield have all added to that mix. And so that makes nine. So you've got nine of the 14 are going to be and that's what makes the top five chase even interesting and and in many ways I think that's why Witness have got a better chance of getting in the top five because all those eight or nine teams are going to be beating each other all through the season which means if Witness keep winning I mean don't get me wrong Witness can only afford to lose maybe another two or three but if they keep winning there's no reason why they can't get up there to that mm. top five no. I mean, I'm still of that sort of thought yeah, that's, that's, that, that's what makes the championship so exciting and I think a lot of fans this year have been pleasantly surprised as well the fact that if, if they would have been asked at the start of the season who's going to be up there, they probably would have said they'd be between Toronto and Witness and maybe Toulouse thrown in there as an underdog. But then you look at the season now, you've got York who've had a ridiculously good start and if they can sustain this for a few more weeks, there's no reason why they can sneak into that top five. Even some of the likes of Featherston and Halifax, who some people maybe thought would be a, sh- a sure shoo-in for that top four, top five, and that that's maybe not going to be the case now. Witness, obviously, with all their off-field troubles. Well, I mean, the, th- the thing is, uh, I said this, Witness have won five out of six. Is it five out of six? Yeah, Witness yeah. won five out of six. Even with the 12 points, they'd still only be fourth. Mm. So that maybe shows that yeah. how many other sides have had good starts yeah, to the so. season, doesn't it? Um, what is interesting as well is that that five-way fight at the bottom, isn't it? For, for, it's a five-way scrap, isn't it, between Dewsbury, Barrow, Batley, Rochdale and Swinton. For me, having seen both Rochdale and Swinton, I, th- I would actually tip Swinton better than Rochdale at this stage of the season. Rochdale, seems have, put a bit decent, odd, really. Rochdale have put a decent team together on paper, haven't they? I, obviously, I haven't seen them yet. They were very see. poor in the first half against I'll see, I'll see you on Sunday, Sunday but because they've had a bit of a disjointed start because they've had two postponements. Mm, very much so. Very much um, so. They had this last season, didn't they? they had a really slow start and then maybe got a little bit better. Um, you know, is the whole dual registration thing a factor with, with Rochdale? You know, is it, uh, do, well, does not, that they've, not had, they've not had that many. They've had a really couple really. of things. They've had like Pat Moran. They've had yeah. Pat Moran, they've had Sitarak World has played a few games there. And He's only played a couple. Yeah, but and even then they've been off the bench. They've still, but if, if they've played, what, six games so far, it's still a third of the season that they've had Akuel for, and he's a former Tonga international. He's a very, I think, I think very certainly player. Swinton obviously used the dual edge better than what Rochdale do. Um, but yeah. Maybe it's having maybe it's having those players available to you more of more often than yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, if you can have the solid if you can have the solid team week in, week out, then um, I am conscious that you're about to exit, so I want to move on to the next point here, James. And um, that's first of all your highlight of the week. Just the one. Um, not, we've not got time for the three, which we're normally <laughs> asking for. Highlight of the week. Um, Nothing like preparation, is it, Dave? <laughs> oh, God, I told him about this twenty minutes before right, we started. On the spot here. <laughs> I mean, I'll ask James set his first, he can do his Go on, I'm sure that you've got your highlights. Yeah, my, my highlight of the week... Bad blood. Uh, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll leave that for someone else to discuss. <laughs> my, my, my highlight of the week's actually, uh, I think I talk about it quite a lot, real good player, Jackson Hastings. I think his, uh, his offload in the in the Salford game was, was out of this world when he set up. I think it was Jake Bibby who scored in the end. 
and he's basically on the floor, two players clambering on her and he somehow flicks it out the back door. It was it was it was the kind of skill that you don't see very often really now. But he's he's, he's just showing what a quality player he is. That Salford, even though it, it was a very close game, that, that could have turned the game for I think in the end was it they, they got beat by Castleford. But when you when you look at that kind of skill, he's he's, he's such a good player and he's, he's one of those guys that you, you want to you want to pay the money just to go and see because he's got that much quality, that much star factor about him. I think I think Hastings has already one off double figures for assists this season, and it's crazy to think. I think he's got more tries and assists combined than any other player in Super League this year, and it just shows how good he's been. But again, it make, makes you think if if he gets injured, obviously we, we don't wish injury upon anyone. But if think about contingency plan for them, if Hastings gets injured, then you wonder whether Salford will struggle because he's been. He's been the key for them this year, really. Do you reckon they'd end up if that happens, Lussick moving out into half back and uh, then Tompkins gets in? Or? Yeah, possibly. Of course, that's one, one thing. Yeah, I think, I think Lussick's more, more than capable of playing half back. It just means that if he moves there, I think you, you'd be asking Robert Louis to step up at a level again. He's, a, he's an orchestrator, he's a leader, he wants to guide the plays, and he's had, he's had that regular partnership in the last few months with, uh, with Jackson Hastings, and then you look at it. You look at if Hastings goes out, maybe it'll take a bit of time for that six, seven partnership to bed in again. I've been really impressed with Salford full stop actually this season. I think that yeah. they've really got things together. I'm really pleased for Ian Watson because you know he's obviously a coach that knows his onions, works really, really hard. Yeah. And to be honest, he's deserved a medal for some of the stuff that he's had to put up with over the last yeah. eighteen months. Well, he's, he's been superb with with the resources he's had as well. I think he, he said as well he'd gone for he'd gone for quality over quantity this year. It's no secret that Salford have Salford have a, a smaller squad compared to a lot of teams in Super League. And the question that I think you've got to think about is if if they get two or three injuries, where where does that leave their squad? Because they are sailing a bit close to the line, in my opinion. You want maybe a little bit more depth to your squad but as I say at, at the moment they're flying high they're getting getting good results so they're right up there at the, at the right end of the table which is what what I think they wanted to start the season you wonder whether by the end of the season I, I think a top six finish for Salford would be good but I, I'm sure Ian Watson after the start they've made he'll have aspiration for getting in that top five uh, I'm going to come to James in just a second see whether he's thought about uh, his highlights of the week. But what were your highlights of the week? Do let us know because I'll be quite happy to, to read through some of those. On that Salford point, it is important to get the points on the board early or on the board early doors. So about the look of London, you know. Yeah, well, that's what I mean because obviously it gets to a point where if you can get five, six, seven wins on the board, even if you get an injury crisis or you have a bit of a blip, you've still got a little bit of a cushion on the uh, on the team as well. I'll go bad blood for the highlight, Dave, just because, I mean, I'm not a massive fan of the bad blood cats line, but, you know, obviously Warrington doing good things this year. Every Friday night Super League game should feel and look like that. It should be a stamp. I think there should only be one Friday night game every week, the televised one, and, you know, that's what that's the product that, you know, when we talk about Ottawa and New York and all that and what they're wanting to buy into, that's what it should look like, and that's what... You know, that's what, if you look at American sports or whatever, that's what they all look like. So It was great to see 13,000 at the ACA, yeah, wasn't it? It was brilliant. The atmosphere was fantastic. And I think we've, we've, we've given them a lot of praise recently and it's very much deserved the Warrington marketing team, the social media channels. It's just, sometimes it's the little things that they do which really, really generate more of an atmosphere. Well, I saw a message that you put on actually on social media saying about they had a band under the concourse, yeah, there they, was face painting, there was all this type of stuff. I mean, I'm a bit old school and I'm sure there might be other people watching this. If I turn up to go to a rugby match, I want to see rugby. So I, yeah. I, the rest of the other stuff is a bit yeah, I'm saying. It's a bit fluffy really for me. But well, I know that people buy into Yeah, it. well, it's, it's in terms of, if you look at rugby in the modern day now and you, you think obviously there are those kind of people who just who want the rugby, that that's their source of entertainment. But then you look at, you look at if a family of four went, for example, do they want more than just rugby? And you think about... They've got the music, they've got the face paint, it's making it it's making it more of a day out. I think the thing is, if you can't sell out Warren and Wigan, then what chance have you got of going to America and selling it out there? Yeah. That's that's you know, and obviously Warrington are now starting to get to that point where you'd like to think you know, it's like the whole ticket price debate that's being had on social this week. It's well, like you've had a bit of a, a, a yeah, someone having a go at you on that. Had a little like, bit of beef, didn't we? Yeah, it's just like, well, you know, so you know, Salford are moaning because... Are you starting the 20s plenty campaign? Was this well, maybe, maybe. I mean, oh. a few Wigan fans are complaining because Salford's match day ticket price is 27 quid and mm -hmm. I did an article saying about how many clubs don't charge... I basically did an article saying I think charging more on the day is 
ridiculous. I don't think it should be done. But £27 to get to Salford when they get 3000 in a 15000 stadium? It's, it's ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? It's just... uh, what do you think about prices around whichever division of rugby that you go watching? Again, that's something that you're not quite happy to join in with the debate. Yeah, we've, had a, we've actually had a, a couple, of, couple of comments coming in. Oh, um, good, yeah. A couple of questions I thought we'd like to answer. Max Folks says... Who do we think Leeds will pick up now that Cassiano deals dead and buried and the prop from Storm has fallen through? Um, <laughs> it's not really... I, I joked before, didn't I? Because obviously Castleford have just released Ben Roberts and they're really struggling at halfback. Yeah. Could we see Ben Roberts heading over to Leeds? Mm. Wouldn't surprise me. Filling Joel Moon's boots. Well, yeah, I've been disappointed with all the I mean, Leeds were looking at Ike Heifer, weren't they, in the, uh, in the off-season? So, mm. you know... Whether he's... Is there still scope there? Is he back in favour? Well, I would presume that... I mean, obviously, it was a bit odd, wasn't it? Because he was dream team, wasn't he? It was a <laughs> yeah. bit odd why Hud I presume Huddersfield wanted to get rid of him for salary cap reasons, to give him yeah. a bit of space. And obviously, Huddersfield only named 18-man squad this week. Whether that's the coach doing a bit of politics to say we we'll need more players. He's Oliver Russell in it. I don't think <laughs> Just out of interest, that's not what you were saying. I mean, the thing you is, know, if you've got an academy, how do you end up naming an 18-man squad? Like, how's that even happened? It's ridiculous, isn't it? But... <sighs> And did you say there was a couple of other points? Yeah, well? we've had we've had another another um, comment slash question off Michael Wilde who says thoughts on Ben Roberts leaving Castleford. I don't know if you've you put that in, but um, it's, it's, it's I didn't give any thoughts on it. I just said that he'd left. I think Ben Roberts is one of those players that uh, just to sort of put put my take on it. First of all, I think he's a very good player. I think he's done a tremendous job there. However, for me, he's not been on the field long enough so if he's been there four years he's only made 78 appearances well that, that's a big thing as well and you look it's at, it, thing you, look at you look at this year as well he's only made one appearance off the bench I think I read and you, you think about if you've got a player on big money like I'm sure he'll be on relatively good money by rugby player standards you want you want that player out on the field and if if it's if it's not working he's not been able to get in the team they, they, they take him off get get more space on the cap and that maybe gives them scope to bring someone new in I think obviously Daryl Powell put massive faith in him didn't he last season and said look we're going to put you at full back and ultimately he didn't deliver yeah. and so you know it's a bit like well, where do you go from there really so um, it was a bit of a surprise when seeing it but I mean he's 33 as well isn't he you know so he's no spring chicken as far as rugby league players go and and, yeah and it's good as well that the, the agreement it sounded like it's quite amicable as well because I'm sure we, we know how much of a professional Ben Roberts is I'm sure if he he would be just as frustrated being on the sidelines and it, it the age that he is, by a rugby player's standards, he would possibly be looking at it and thinking, right, do it, do it, leave here, get back to full fitness and try and try and find another club to maybe finish his career with. He's, he's had some superb moments with the Tigers. I think, I remember the 2017 League Leader Shield they won, scored that famous last-minute drop goal against St. Helens. So he's had, he's had some good memories and I, I think he'll live long in the mind of a lot of Castleford fans. He's a player I've always enjoyed watching, but I think when they've looked at it, they've done like the maths and they probably looked at how many games he's actually played mm. compared with how many he's missed or how many he's not made the squad for. Mm. Uh, and I think it, it, it stacks up, so it's just it's rugby business, unfortunately. Sometimes it, it can be a bit cutthroat like that, can't it? I'll take that opportunity to sneak off, Dave. Right, <laughs> thank you very much, James. Thank you all. Uh, again, we'll, we'll have some good buys for James. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers from the back. Right, okay. <laughs> right. And then there were two of us. And then there were two. This is, it's, it's like Genesis all over again, this, it's isn't the, it? This is... it's, it's take that. <laughs> it's, take, it's take that with Robbie going. It's like S Club 7 turning into S Club 3. I'm sure he'll be it. back soon. Right, yeah. okay. Um, I know we've not really talked about Super League, have we? No. We've, we've not touched on Super League at all. So... Give us your thoughts. Last round of the Super League, what do you reckon? Uh, it was it was interesting. There was, there was a lot of a lot of close games, which I thought was sort of thing. The 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 big game for me was London, London getting getting oh, getting it heading. It, it, that was an amazing finish to that game. Who would have who would have thought that at the start of the season? And we're talking about getting points on the board before. <laughs> I mean, they're already sat there with three wins, aren't That's they? And, thinking that... and this was, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, us, us three kind of like sat around before the start of the season. I mean, we're looking at where the first win might come from. Yeah. Now, they, they knocked that out of the park, didn't they, when they beat Wakefield? But then you were thinking, look, OK, they've done that, they've got it off the mark. Where are those other wins coming from? That's the thing. They're doing it. That, that, that's what everyone was saying. When, when you look at the start of the season and you think, <coughs> pardon me, you think, you think, right, the first home game, obviously they'll have a big crowd, they want to showcase what they can do, obviously coming into Super League. They got that win and then you think, right, where are the wheels going to fall off? Are the, are the, the losses going to start creeping in away from home? And... Leeds at home are normally formidable. Obviously, this year they've not been the best, but 
it, it's it's a real coup for any team to go to go to Headingley and pick up a win, let alone a newly promoted one. I think it shows it shows the, the belief and the team spirit that Danny Ward instilled in that Broncos team. He's got a lot of players who arguably that they've had chances in Super League before. You've got Kieran Dixon, you've got Reese Williams, you've got a lot of players like that who Ryan Morgan as well, that that's just three for example. You've got you've got that right mixture of players who've done it before and maybe want to show that they're at they really are Super League standard. And then you've got these young hungry guys who haven't haven't been there before, they've not had that experience and they, they want to have a crack at Super League and get their get their name out there. I, I think he's doing a tremendous job, he's he's Danny Ward and at the moment if he carries that on then surely he's got to be in with a chance of coaching. Well, I, I, I know generally that tends to be the kiss of death, doesn't it, in coaching because you does. normally get nominated <laughs> or you get the award and then you sat the year after but well, I, so I, he's I, doing a great job. I think that if if we chose it now I think there'd only be two two teams or two managers who'd be in there obviously Justin Holbrook's had a good start with the with the squad he's had but I think I, I can't see past Ian Watson at Salford and then Danny Ward I think I think if London managed to stay up I think it's got to go to Danny Ward because at the start of the season they were they were everyone's everyone's certainty for the wooden spoon everyone was saying oh this is a flash in the pan they're gonna go straight back down a championship squad championship this championship that and they've proved everyone wrong uh, what do you make of Catalans as well? Because I mean that that was a difficult victory for them. I mean, I think they also had were was it three of the players ended up with concussion and not being able to go back on. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. It, it really was in, wasn't it? I know they were really in, in the wars. They were. I think that's something that we've seen with uh, with Super League a lot this year. We've had we've had a lot of a lot of physical games. Maybe when these rules were brought in about the shot clock, which was intended to have some of the more flair players exploiting the space towards the end of the game and maybe rugby league trying to market itself as being a more flamboyant sport and you look at it this season we've had a lot more battles i think people have that that's the thing that i've enjoyed watching i've liked seeing the tussle between between super league teams which is uh, i don't know there's been there's been a lot of battles and that that that's what i like to watch i know obviously that the flashy rugby is nice but everyone wants to see a good scrap, don't they? I mean, to be fair as well, we're, 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 we're talking about flashy rugby. Generally, you don't tend to get it until the ground's firm up, you know, so we're probably talking about, you know, May, June time, really, aren't we, before we're going to see the benefit. Exactly, but, but we say that about some of the flashy players not coming to the floor until the the pitch is improved. And then you highlighted one from Jackson Exactly, Hastings. Jackson Hastings. So he's, they, he's there in players' lockers, isn't it? Exactly. Play, if, if you're a good halfback, you should be able to create and produce produce opportunities for your teammates regardless of what the what the time of the year is regardless of what the pitch is like Hastings is testament to that nine nine assists already I think he's he's, he's setting the benchmark he's, it's almost as if he's saying to the other halves in the league come on yeah catch come on yeah, exactly catch me if you can <laughs> step your game up and that's that's been quite interesting to watch I think Hastings obviously is 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 Salford, I think Salford's best player by to carry on my rants from last week oh gosh here we go George Williams you have been set the benchmark. Jackson Hastings is burning you off so far. He is exactly Hastings is Hastings is trailblazing everyone else. All these marquee players. You look at George Williams, Lola Heyer, got these half Oh, they're up. just in his way, can't they? Exactly, they're all they're all in his <laughs> dust about fifty yards behind, just waving at him. Uh, I also wanted to mention as well about Wakefield and the Hull's recent winning streak. I mean, that was. I think it was more the magnitude of that, that, that performance more than anything else. I mean, 32-12 away at Hull, he's like a comprehensive performance. Exactly, and taken to the fact that I think at half-time it was 14-12, and then they, they've kept a Hull side scoreless in the second half on their own patch. And I think when you, when, when you look at that, it's, it's a real good performance. You, the thing with Wakefield this year is they've been a bit hit and miss, so they'll get like a brilliant result like we saw at Hull, like we saw at Leeds. But then it's the other games that they're not winning, the London Broncos, those kind of things where... They're not, they're not showing up. And I think if Wakefield have ambitions of that top five, they can't just be showing flashes of brilliance every now and then. I think it needs to be more consistent. But I, you, I do say this, and you say this in the fifth at the moment. Yeah. OK, uh, like we were talking about in the Championship, there's a real log jam of teams. So you've got Wakefield, Hull, Hull, Kingston Rovers, Catalans and London all locked on six points. Well, out, out, out of all those teams that you've said, I think Wakefield's have the best chance of doing well. But that's purely because... You look at their their front row as you've got. I think we highlighted in a piece that I did for Love League, uh, the team of the week from this week. We had a lot of Wakefield players in there. We we talk about the quality of their backs, and obviously Tupu's out injured. You've got Tom Johnson, who unfortunately is, that's a massive blow. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a massive blow indeed. But then you you look at look at the forwards, and I think we highlighted Paulie Paulie. 
It was so good they named him twice. I hate that. <laughs> uh, so what, what, what was his work rate then? Uh, did, it, did he actually? Yeah, he, that? he was he was sensational. I can't, I can't remember the exact carries, but I yeah. think he made he made more meters than anyone else out of right, the pitch. Okay. He was he was tackling hard, and you you think back to the Pauli Pauli of twenty eighteen. He was a good player, but he could only do it in ten minute bursts. Yeah, he was more just a bench player, wasn't he? You exactly. bring him on, rustle things up a little bit. And exactly, and now on. obviously against Hull, he did start on the bench, but he played more minutes. He's playing 40, 50 minutes, and as a front row, that's superb. And when yeah. you've got David Fafita alongside him, that I always uh, like Fafita. I really a, like watching him. He's play. a fantastic player, and those two together are just. He's I, also bringing back cycling shorts again, which went out oh in the gosh. 90s. So that's, that's, that's a fine look. And he's getting the mullet. Oh, God, I think we need to keep that look in the 90s. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we want to bring that back at all. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's, it's good for Wakefield. I mean, I, I'd argue that if Paulie Paulie and David Fafita yeah. are, at, at the moment, outside of the top two, I reckon they're the best best front row combination in the league. I think Paulie Paulie crossed for a try, I think, as well against Hull. And if, if my memory serves me right, it was a rampaging run and... Mm-hmm. It's uh, that that that's what you want your front rows to be doing. It's not all about the meters. It's about the the line breaks. I think I can't remember whether it was Paulie Paulie or for feet, but one of them made I think eight tackle busts in that game. I mean, you're doing well to be honest. If as a front row, you're actually busting the line, you're making <laughs> line breaks. You know, exactly. Usually that's, that's to your wide men, isn't it? Exactly. That's you, their job. They're, exactly. The job of the wide men is to have the have the space, and that that's created by the men down the middle. But obviously, if you guys down the middle are pr- making those breaks, they're making yards, breaking the line, then Privacy doing something right. Uh, so those are, well, I mean, I picked out a couple of games though. They were my highlights of the week. From a slightly different point of view regarding highlights, I want to mention Workington because we don't talk about Workington Town enough on this show. And I've got a bit of a, a Cumbrian <laughs> loving, as you know, uh, thanks to my time on tour in Fiji. And <laughs> uh, I, I just, I really like the stuff that that club is doing. Um, and Sid will put up a great fight in the Challenge Cup game that was played at yeah. the weekend. Uh, but working to won by 22 points to nil. But I think it was more the genuine respect that both sides had for each other. I watched on social media a couple of the videos that they put on and yeah. uh, some of the comments that were coming from that game. And that's just, I, I like that sort of whole respect. And sometimes yeah. that gets lost a little bit. Exactly. Rugby, as much as it's about all these showcase events, about these players knocking 10 bells out of each other or whatever, and all these players going after you, it's about respect at the end of the day. It's about finishing a game, finishing that battle, shaking hands with the opposition and appreciating what's good about the other team. And I think they've been really good. I think I, <clears throat> I have a bit of a soft spot for working to the club purely because... Oh, think, what's, what's your reason? Well, I think I remember when I was covering the League One final last year when they, they right. took on Bradford and they were they were unlucky at the fact that the, the injuries that they had, I think they, they couldn't have come at a worse time. And you, I, I, I do want them to do well this year because they've got a good coach, they've got good players. And it's all, on the subject of Workington, it might be completely wrong, but I know we've had, um, there's been a lot of speculation in the last few days, don't know if you've seen about Chris Sandow about him talking about his return to Rugby League. What's he being picked out potentially at Workington? Well, he's, uh, he's on his social media, on his Instagram, um, someone said, um, where are you going? And he said that the team begins with a W and it has an I in it. And you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to deduce it to a few teams. You've got the Warringtons, the Wakefields, I can't see him getting in Super League. So you wonder whether Workington League One, they maybe take a gamble on in that. If I had to put money on, I could see him ending up at Workington Town. And that would be an interesting move. I mean, obviously they had Jared Summer a couple of years ago playing there on a two-year deal. Uh, yeah, he was a big favourite during his time. That's the thing. They're, they're obviously they've obviously got a track record of getting getting fan favourites, people who are maybe rough diamonds. We know all the quality that Sandal possesses, but then he's maybe he's lost his way in recent years. He's been out of the game for a long time. That. That's why I think that the top two divisions probably wouldn't take a gamble on him mm-hmm. when he's been out of the game for that long. He's put a little bit of weight on, so it might take him a little bit of time to get back to full fitness. But you look at the likes of Workington, and they'll, they'll be thinking, right, we've got this player who's eager to get back into the game. He's eager to come back to English rugby. And they might be thinking, right, we're the perfect place for him. Because I think if if they got him, even until the end of the season, give him a try. Because I'm not sure exactly how old he is. Maybe 33, I want to say. is. He's, again, he's, he's getting on a little bit by rugby player standards, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see him there because if, if, he's, if he's as passionate about the game as he as he says, then I think a move like that could could be good for him. Mm. 
What are our fans saying? Have we had any more comments at all, James? Um, we've had um, a couple of comments from from a few minutes ago. They're actually talking about witness again from when we were discussing that. All right. Had, <clears throat> um, will Gelling come back to the UK or is his return down under just a smoke screen? Now, as far as we know, it's just family issues, isn't it? It's to do with helping. I think the the official line is helping. That's the official help. line, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think we'll see him again. I've got to admit. I, 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 I honestly don't. I think the, maybe they're looking at things. They're weighing up how much they're paying on his contract. I think, I think one of the maybe it's a way out. Well, I might, I might be. I might be wrong, but I think one of the things is possibly about transferring his visa from the old witness to the new witness company because obviously he would have been registered under the old witness business when they've gone out of bust and they've set up a new business in company's house. Of course, there's all these things that we, we just wouldn't normally consider. Exactly, it's all, all these external factors that you've got to consider, especially with a team like witness yeah. at, at the minute where they are. I think I think the fans will be very disappointed if he doesn't come back, but he's, 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 he's been brilliant for the championship and brilliant for witness. He's, he's put bums on seats and you'd like to see him return, wouldn't you? I wonder whether he will come back. Maybe, I, maybe it's, this is just a cynic in me because we had, we had a similar sort of situation, didn't we, with um, about 12, 13 years ago with David Peachy, who was a real top Australian player at the time. Actually, was signed while Witness was still in Super League, similar to the Kelling situation. He said he'd come across and he'd, uh, he, he'd uh, honour his contract. He played ten games, did David Peachy, and went back to Australia and playing in the NRL. Well, he, it, so I just wonder. <coughs> yeah, well, some some of these players, I think I think Gellin's the kind of person who he will, if he can, he will honour his contract. It's 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 been great for the club. He's obviously got a real affiliation with the fans, and I think that's something that witnesses will have to weigh up the the yeah. idea of him being on big money, whether they can afford him. Is the the main the main issue in terms of keeping until the end of the season, but then you look at what's, what's Gelling bringing in, he's getting fans into the stadium. His social media videos, I don't know if you've seen many of them, they're, they're absolutely fantastic. I think some of the things he puts out are hilarious. I think even if they bring an extra 10, 15, even 20 fans to a game, then he's doing something right. So that's, that's the role of a player like him. Talking about social media postings, did you see that one from Fenston? I've not, no. Yeah, they've, sort of, they've, got, the, the, they've got Percy the Pony. Yeah. And... Uh, forgive me for saying this, Roger the Ram from Dewsbury Ram. Oh, <laughs> it's Featherstone against Roger, and they've done a kind of Silence of the Lambs thing, oh, gosh. where they've they've wheeled <coughs> they've wheeled Percy the Pit Pony out on something, all wrapped up, straight jacket on. It's quite funny. It is quite funny. I'll have a watch of that. After that the show. Year, Glenn, but yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend and, and, and look it up. There we go. Dave's recommendation of the week. Dave's yeah. recommendation. Um, Right, I'm on to, I want to move us on to amateur picks of the week. Now, I had a mer last week <laughs> because all these games that I said, definitely make sure you go to this one if you're in the area and you're looking at uh, back in an amateur club. They were all called off, bad weather. There was only a few games which survived it. Um, mine was one of them which I went to over at Dewsbury. Uh, Dewsbury Celtic had a, a great afternoon with me. <laughs> platform sinking in the mud oh, gosh. having to dig myself out horizontal rain uh, bumped into Danny Thomas though he used to play over at Batley he had a great game for yeah. Jeffrey Celtic scored a try and they won by 16 points to 12 on a right glue pot of a pitch <laughs> however moving us on to this week these are my picks for if you're in the area and you want to watch some amateur action so in the Premier Division we've got Siddle taking on Hunslet Club Parkside Siddle usually one of the top clubs in the amateur leagues, Hunter Club Parkside, they won the lot last season. Uh, West Hull against Rochdale Mayfield. Mayfield have been a, a real club in form over the course of the start of the season. Division 1, I've picked out one fixture, which is Normanton Knights against Saddleworth Rangers. I think that's going to be a really good game. Division 2, I've picked out two games Barrow Island taking on Ascombe, which is a derby match. There's always so, a bit of a bit of added. There will we'll be a bit of bump, I think, about that one. And Bradford Dudley Hill taking on Wigan St Jude's because nobody likes to go to Bradford Dudley Hill. <laughs> and Wigan St Jude's on the day are, in my opinion, the best team in Division 2. So there's a lot of good games to watch out yeah, for. Yeah, Division 3 I picked out two games as well. I always pick out my team, Lee East, because they're <laughs> at home against uh, Wollstone Rovers. So, of course, with us filming this in Warrington, I'm hoping that many people watching this who are maybe around this area will end up going to that one. Uh, and Eastmore Dragons, usually, again, one of the top teams. They've won two of the three matches so far, up against early pace setters in Division 3, Waterhead Warriors. 
love at Slight and Games to watch out for. Plenty to look out for. Um, looking ahead to the fixtures this weekend, and I, I'm, I'm just... Just call who you think is going to win these. I'm, I'm, I'm on again, the spot here. Let's again, have I've not really had a chance to sort of prepare anything, so apologies for the lack of, of postings. It actually takes quite a bit of work administering that. I never realised that I've created a monster, I think. I'll say the fans are growing restless now. They want their they want the, the pick back. They want the pick back. So I'll try my best to get it next week. I know I said the same thing last week, <laughs> so I do apologise. But here are the fixtures. In the Betfred Super League, Thursday's game tonight sees Wakefield against Warrington. Warrington. Friday sees Castleford against St Helens. Castleford. Huddersfield against Hull Kingston Rovers. Hull Kingston Rovers. Saturday sees Catalans hosting Leeds Rhinos. Catalans. And Sunday sees London take on Hull. London. And Salford host Wigan. <sighs> Salford. I'm liking it. You're, you're, the pain is going to continue for Wigan as far as you're concerned. I think so. Against against a, a, a Salford side who have been in relatively good form. Spoke about them a lot. Our Drew will be head button his keyboard at the moment. <laughs> without, without doubt. In Betfred Championship, Saturday sees Batley against Toulouse. That's a game you'll be able to watch on the Our League app. Great bit of news for the Our League app, by the way, that it's just surged past 100,000 subscribers. Fantastic. It's great to know, isn't it? Very good. There's still work to do, obviously, yeah. but the output that they're pouring out is, is, is good. Uh, it's regular and it's getting it's spreading rugby league, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm, I'm really pleased that that's one good news story that we can report as opposed <laughs> to battering what's behind Ottawa. And I'll say, we're not all doom and gloom on this we're show. We're not all we? doom and gloom. Is that the hashtag positive rugby league that other people are saying <laughs> about? You know, but like, that, is a, that is a positive news story as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Sunday sees Barrow against... Oh, who do you think is going to win in that? Batley or Toulouse? Toulouse. Okay. Sunday sees Barrow against Swinton. Barrow. Bradford take on Lee Centurions. Bradford. Oh. <laughs> and I'll move a bit further away then. <laughs> uh, Featherstone Rovers against Dewsbury Rams. Featherstone. Okay. Halifax taking on Toronto. Toronto. Rochdale Hornets against the Witness Vikings. The Vikings. York City Knights taking on Sheffield Eagles. Oh, that'll be a good one. I'd, I'd have to tip York, I think. Uh, I would go Sheffield on that one. Yeah. Purely because they found a way to win last week in a bad-tempered match at, against Dewsbury. At the start of the season, if you would have asked that, it would have been oh, no brainer. York won't win that. Oh, the, the start of May, I can't oh, against them. They have been very good. They have been very good. Again, you know, big fan of what they're doing at the moment. Down fantastic there club, fantastic run. Betfred League One Saturday West Wales Raiders against Whitehaven. Whitehaven. Sunday Hunslet against Coventry. Hunslet, or I should say Hunslet against Coventry Burrs if I'm <laughs> full names. Uh, Keithley Cougars taking on North Wales Crusaders. Keithley. Yeah, they've got the home advantage as well. Yeah. Keithley. Oldham at home to London Scholars. Scholars. Really? Yeah. You're tipping the school. That yeah. would be a right upset. I'd like to throw one. a couple of them, a couple of curveballs. Yeah, that really there. is a curveball. Don't go blame me, old <laughs> fans. Workington against Newcastle. That's a, a big test. Then he expects his first in charge, isn't it? Yeah, I think new new management there. I think you can't. I, I can't bet against Newcastle. I think. I think when you have a first game, there's always that that extra extra bit of wanting to impress and wanting to. To make your mark, so I think I think Newcastle will have that one. Uh, so we've just about reached the end of our broadcast for today. Has anybody else got any last words? For yeah, we've got us? we've got we've got a job for you from uh, for next week from Ian Gallagher. It says, right. Dave. Yeah. Can you buy some WD forty for that squeaky door? Oh, we, we're we're trying to get a sponsor. I mean, if you want, I, I'm sure we could start a crowdfunding thing for for yeah. some WD forty. Tell something. people to sit still for an hour. Uh, and what we'll do, <laughs> what we'll do, we'll try and get some of those. Um, you know, silence of the lambs, things that go around people and they can sit in the chairs and they're not moving. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for all your comments. It's been great again, so I've really enjoyed all your interaction. Thank you to James who left us and the James that remains. <laughs> the James that remains. Hey, like I'm a one. poet and I didn't know it. <laughs> it is, of course, National Poetry Day as well, but I guess you didn't know that either. And it's your birthday. And it's been Happy birthday. Go and enjoy your birthday much. now, Dave. That's where it is. I'm off for a... a I'm off for a, a cafe latte, I think. Oh, very nice. There we go. Do your birthday uh, in style. Do join us again next week. Keep in touch with everything that's going on, on the site, by the way, folks. That also includes a, a lovely interview that I did with Sean Briscoe. Uh, actually did it about 18 months ago and had to bring it up to date a little bit. But it's still worthwhile listening, if only for his tales about how he missed his uh, chance to play in a Challenge Cup final. But uh, that's been us. 
Join us again, same place, same time, next week.